Well, we're going to continue on in our series about learning how to be successful in life. And this week, we're going to talk about learning by God's encouragement. And one of the greatest leaders in the entire Bible, who we, we spoke about last week, is Moses. And even when considering all the faults he may have had, and the times that he doubted that God could really use him, Moses still rises head and shoulders over most others who have heard the call from God. You see, it was Moses who God used to confront Pharaoh and deliver the ten plagues. It was Moses who God used to part the Red Sea. It was Moses who was given the Ten Commandments. And, and over and over again, Moses was used as a mighty leader for God. He led Israel for decades and, and was known and respected as God's man for that time in history. But there came a time for, for Moses to pass on the mantle of leadership that he held for so many years. And who did he hand it to? None other than Joshua. Now, can you imagine being Joshua? Huh? Having to follow such a great man as Moses who proved himself over and over again, that's quite a responsibility. But the good news is, is that God was not only with Joshua every step of the way, but he offered him instruction and words of encouragement that would help him to accomplish everything that God wanted Joshua to do. And I doubt if any of us are in a position that's exactly like Joshua's area of responsibility, but many of us need to hear the words of encouragement and strength that Joshua heard when he needed the most. So with that in mind, we're going to look at how God told Joshua and what he told him can be applied to every one of us today. And the first thing God told Joshua was to... Let go of yesterday. Let go of yesterday. So let's go now to the Word and the book of Joshua, chapter 1, verse 1. And it said, After the death of Moses, the Lord's servant, the Lord spoke to Joshua, son of Nun, who was Moses' assistant. And he said, Moses, my servant, is dead. Therefore, the time has come for you, meaning Joshua, to lead these people. <clears throat> and I want you to lead the Israelites across the Jordan River into the land that I am giving them. Now, the most important thing God said here was that Moses, my servant, is dead. Why did God mention that fact? Maybe it because it was a time for change, and it was a time to quit looking backward and start looking toward the future. And when Joshua looked back at the past, what did he see? Well, he saw those high expectations of the people of Israel as they finally had a deliverer to bring them out of bondage. He, he saw miracle after miracle from Almighty God. He saw the great man of God, Moses, do incredible things and take amazing steps of faith as he worked by his side. So looking back at yesterday and knowing that he now was to lead the people of Israel, there's no doubt about Joshua's level of feeling insecure and inadequate. I'm sure we've all felt that way. We've had times in our life when we were called upon to take other leaders' places, and wow, we didn't think we could live up to our predecessor's accomplishments. And maybe in the marriage, there's certain ideals that you've seen lived out in the life of other people, and, and you don't think you could be like they were. Or maybe to share your faith, have you ever stood in the shadow of others who, who boldly pronounce and the gospel of Jesus Christ without hesitation? Well, too often in, in every area of our life, we base our future on what we've seen in the past. God's word to Joshua and his word to us is, let go of yesterday. Let go of yesterday. It don't matter what somebody else accomplished or how somebody else does things. You see, God said, listen, Moses is dead. It's time to move on. You see, God wants us to take on the role he's given 
to each and every one of us. Forget about what everybody else did. God said, Moses is dead. It's time to move on. We can, we can all find role models and mentors who have been there before, but today God is calling us personally to be the person that He wants us to be. What else did God tell Moses? Number two, He said, I want you to claim my promises. Claim God's promises. God promises that He will be with us in, in, in any venture that He chooses for us to be part of. That's important to remember that He chooses, not that we try to do on our own. In other words, He will equip us with whatever is necessary to get the job done as long as it's something He wants done. Joshua chapter 1 again, verse 2. Moses, my servant, is dead. Therefore, the time has come for you to lead these people, the Israelites, across the Jordan River and into the land I'm giving them. Verse 3. I promise you, God says, what I promised Moses. Wherever you set foot, you will be on land that I have given you. Now, there's several promises of God that we find in this chapter of the word of Joshua. And the first is the promise of God's will for our lives. The promise of God's will for our lives. So in order to discover God's will for our life, what do we have to do? Well, we have to invite Him to be the Lord of our lives, right? Which means He's going to be in charge, not us. Okay, so once we've done that, once we accept Him as Lord, we'll be able to discern God's will by doing what? Like when you come to a railroad crossing. Stop, look, and listen. Stop what you're doing. Look and listen to what it is that God wants you to do. So how do we do this? Well, in a number of ways. Number one, we listen to God's will through what? Through His Word. Through Scripture. Psalm 119, verse 105. It says, Your Word is what? A lamp for my feet and a light for my path. God's Word will light up the path that He wants us to travel in this life. We also listen to God's will through prayer. That's how we communicate with God. Through prayer. James chapter 1, verse 5. It says, listen, if you want to know what God wants you to do, ask Him. It says, and He will gladly tell you for he is what? <clears throat> he is always ready to give a bountiful supply of wisdom to who? To all who do what? Ask him. And it says he's not going to be mad about it. He's not going to resent that you ask him. How else do we know about God's will? Through the counsel of other godly people. Through the counsel of other godly people. Proverbs chapter 15, verse 22 says, Our plans fail for lack of what? Counsel. But with many advisors, what happens? They succeed. Get the counsel or advice of other godly people. How else do we listen to God's will? Through our circumstances. Through our circumstances. And I want to demonstrate this by the story of Esther in the Bible. <clears throat> and we have to go back in history to the time when King, King Xerxes ruled over 127 provinces from India to Kush. And he was famous not for his ruling ability so much, but for his drinking parties of all things. Now, he wanted his queen named Vashti to be displayed in the front of everyone to see how beautiful she was. But guess what? She refused to come, and the king was furious, and he dismissed her. And he sent a royal decree to all households that women must obey their husbands. He was mad. He wanted to show off this beautiful queen, but she wouldn't come. So he got rid of her. Then what happened? Esther was chosen for queen, for a queen. But her nationality was hidden from the king because she was Jewish. She was timid and easygoing. 
Then scripture tells us about the anger of the high court official named Haman when he, when he thought he had been slighted by Mordecai, who was Esther's stepfather, who lied about the whole thing. And Haman would determine then to have revenge. He would not only have Mordecai executed, but he would have his entire race, the Jewish race, eliminated. And when Haman asked the king for permission, the king issued an order to kill the Jews. Now Mordecai urged Esther, listen, go speak to the king because you've got to save your race. Well, she was afraid. I'm, I'm timid and shy. How am I going to save my entire race? Now let's go to the Bible now, Esther chapter 4, verse 11. It said, all the king's officials and even the people in the provinces know that anybody who appears before the king in his inner court without being invited is doomed to die. Unless the king holds out his golden scepter and the king has not called for me to come for 30 days, she said, I can't just walk in there. Verse 12. So Hatach gave Esther's message to Mordecai, and then Mordecai sent this reply back to Esther. He said, listen, don't think for a moment that because you're in the palace you will escape when all the other Jews are killed. Verse 14, if you keep quiet at a time like this, deliverance and relief for the Jews will arise from some other place, but you and your relatives, they're going to die. So no matter what you do, you're going to die. Who knows that perhaps maybe you were made queen for just a time like this. So what did Esther do? She overcame her fear and she spoke to the king and set up a meeting with her stepfather and the king to discuss the wrongful plot of Haman. And the king wanted to help it, but according to custom, he said once a royal decree had been published, he can't take it away. So the king gave Mordecai his seat and told him, here, you write any decree in my name that will correct the situation. That way it'll be okay. And the new decree simply gave the Jews the right to organize and protect themselves by killing others who were trying to kill them. They weren't allowed to plunder any of the people they killed. In other words, just rob them. And no, the, the whole idea was to keep them from killing them. So their motives could not be of greed only as defenders. So when the appointed day came, the Jews did defend themselves, and many of their enemies were killed, and Mordecai became a powerful figure in the empire and used his permission to, position to promote the welfare of the Jewish people. Now this great deliverance reported in Esther is celebrated today by Jews everywhere, and it's on March 13th and 14th. It's known as the Feast of Purim. But the point of this story is, like Esther, you see, we're not trapped by our own weakness like she thought she was, and God uses us as we are, placing us where we can serve Him. She was indeed made queen for a specific purpose, and that was to save her race. Through our circumstances, we listen to God's will. How else? Through our desires. That may sound strange through our desires. But what does Psalm 37 and 4 say? Take the light in the Lord, and He will give you your what? Your heart's desires. What's in your heart? Well, if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, right, then your heart is filled with God's desires. Sometimes the scripture is misused. Say, oh, anything you desire, they're going, God's going to give you. No, He's going to give you things you desire that's in line with His desires. What does the Scripture say? If you're filled with the Holy Spirit, right? Take the light in the Lord and He'll give you His heart's desire. So if you're filled with God or the Holy Spirit, then your desires are the same as God's and He will give you your desires. Alright, so we covered several ways that can help us find God's will in our life. So let's look at another one of God's promises. The promise of God's power and His presence in your life. Look at what it says in Joshua 1 and 5. It says, no one, no, not a single person, will be able to stand against you as long as what? As long as you live. Why? Because I will be with you as I was with Moses, the Lord says. I'm not going to abandon you. So what we need to understand is that God is not going to send us 
somewhere where he can't sustain us. No, he said he'd be with us every place we go. I'm not going to fail or abandon you. Once we understand God's will for our life, we need to have faith that he's going to be there every step of the way, no matter what he's called us to do. Amen. You see, when we understand that God will always be there, it builds our confidence. It helps us gain new perspective. It gives us new peace. It, it, it gives us the courage to face whatever may come. Another one of God's promises is His promises of prosperity and success in our lives. Prosperity and success. All these things found in Joshua. Chapter 1, verse 7. It says, Do what? Be strong and courageous. What else? Be careful to obey all the instructions Moses gave. Don't deviate from them, turning either to the right or to the left. In other words, stay on course. Then you will what? Be successful in how many things? In everything that you do. Study this book of instruction continually, verse 8. Meditate it on day and night. So you will be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then will you prosper and succeed in everything that you do. Study the Bible continuously. Meditate on what you read. Be sure to obey what you read. And then you will prosper and succeed in all you do. So not, God will not only reveal His will to you, He'll also give you His power, His presence, to do what? To move you towards success in fulfilling His call on your life. Now, can you imagine having a guarantee like that, that when you start out on a venture, you're going to be successful no matter what? That's what God tells us if we do His will, right? Now, wait a minute. It would be remiss if we didn't take some time to explore the fact that God's encouragement in this text comes with some conditions. It comes with some conditions. Yes, God will do all that He's promised, but there's some expectations that are laid down on us. What are these conditions? <clears throat> Study the Scripture. Study the Scripture. What good is having God's Word there if you don't read it? I know I used to travel a lot, and I'm sure you've traveled on airplanes, and when you get to that, if you're placed in one of the seats next to the window, next to the exit door, there's some good things about it because it's nice and wide, there's plenty of leg room and so forth, but normally before the plane takes off, the flight attendant comes up and says, have you read the instruction card that tells you how to open the door in case of an emergency? And if you're like me, uh, you say, oh yeah, well, I've read that when in fact I didn't read it. But you know, you figure, well, it doesn't take a rocket science to know that you simply turn the handle and open the door and everybody leaves through there. So yeah, you naturally say, yeah, yeah, I, I know what's in there. But the, the stewardess is not born yesterday. She knows you probably didn't read it. And then she'll come back before the plane takes off and said, listen, if an emergency happens, I'll be depending on you to open that door, and dozens of other people in this plane are relying on you too. So, are you sure you know what's in that car? Well, guess what? The lady suddenly has your attention, doesn't she? Because now you know that you're required to do something. You better know how to open that door in case of an emergency. It's the same with listening and reading God's Word. Just like sitting in the exit row in the airplane, as Christians we need to read the instructions carefully, and those instructions are found where? In the Word of God. What does it say? Joshua 1 and 8. Study this book of instruction continually, meditate on it day and night, so you'll be sure to what? Obey everything written in it. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. Only then will you prosper and succeed. So if we're not spending regular quality time with God's Word, we can't expect to know His will, or we can't expect to be successful. What's another condition? It says, we need to obey God. 
obey God. He said, not only do we need to study his word, but we need to obey and do what it's written in there. In other words, head knowledge isn't going to be enough. We've got to do something with the knowledge we have. We've got to start living what we're learning. To use God's word effectively, we need to know it in my head. It's called memorization, right? I need to stow it in my heart. It's called meditation. I need to show it in my life. It's called visualization. And I need to sow it in the world. It's called evangelism. God also says, be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. You see, Joshua was going to face pressures like you and I have couldn't even dream about. He was taking over the leadership of the people of Israel. Literally hundreds of thousands of people would be looking to him to show him the way to the promised land. There were battles to be fought. Lives would be lost. Tremendous pressure and stress at every turn. But with God's promises and encouragement, <clears throat> the ones we've looked at today, Joshua would face all these things with strength and with courage that's beyond what a mortal man is capable of. Now, most of us probably won't have thousands of people relying on us like Joshua, but we're on an adventure of a lifetime. Yes, we are. When we accept God's will and God's way in our lives, we can take strength and courage just by listening to God who has called us and instructed us. We have the strength and courage that can only come from listening and obeying His Word. How many times in our lives have we failed to do what we've been called by God to do because we didn't think we had the strength, the courage, or the knowledge to do it? God used Moses to confront Pharaoh and deliver the ten plagues. Moses parted the Red Sea, gave the Ten Commandments. God used him over and over again. And God even met Moses' every excuse of why he couldn't do all these things. Because what he wanted to do is give Moses power and courage to get the job done. Stop coming up with excuses and get the job done. Stop worrying about the past and get the job done. God's word to Joshua and his word to us is let go of yesterday. It don't matter what somebody else accomplished or how somebody else did something. Moses is dead. It's time to move on. God is encouraging us today. He's telling you, listen, let go of yesterday. I, I promise, His promises to you is His will, His power, His presence, His prosperity, His success. He wants us to study the Scripture, to obey Him, to be strong and courageous. He says, I want you to step out as far as you can and do the impossible, and I'll be with you every step of the way. He's waiting for you right now. He won't take that step. For you, you've got to do it yourself. Make a decision that can change your life. Let's pray. Lord, we, we thank you, Lord. Thank you that you've called us all to perform something for you for the kingdom. Thank you for the privilege of serving, serving Almighty God, the creator of this universe, our creator. Help us not to come up with excuses, Lord. Help us to know your word, to read your word, to meditate it, to know what it is that you want us to do, to listen to you through prayer, through your word, through our circumstances, through our desires. And give us that courage that you said you would. No matter what you want us to do, Lord, help us to understand that we're not doing this by ourselves. We're doing it with your help, with your support, with your leadership. But we know, Lord, that before we can accept your calling in our life, we have to know you as Lord and Savior. We ask that those who are listening today that may not know you as Lord and Savior of their life, to they would open their heart today and confess to you their sins and the fact that they want you to come in, cleanse them of your sins, and open up their hearts to let you come in and be Lord over them in everything they do, to be the head of their life, to follow you, and to 
be open to your will for each and every one of them. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. We thank the Lord.